I never thought in my wildest dreams I would ever be the coach at a high university. It was something that just happened. Joe Carbone's ultimate destination was unknown to him earlier in his career, but the idea of becoming a coach had been on his mind for quite some time. In uh, our little community back in Elkland, Pennsylvania, we had a, a physical education teacher and a health teacher named Mr. Myers. And Mr. Myers was our soccer coach, our basketball coach, and our baseball coach. He coached everything. And he was a guy that uh, we all look up to. He was a guy that uh, was always talking to us about getting strong and eating the right foods and doing the right thing and practice hard and compete and all those things that you need to do to be a good athlete. He was always constantly talking to us about that. So um, I had a good experience with him when I was in high school, then a great experience with Coach Wren, you know, when I was here playing. And uh, so my goal in life was to be a uh, uh, go back to Elkland, Pennsylvania and be the high school basketball and baseball coach there. <laughs> that was my goal when I came here as a student athlete. Being a coach is something that came naturally and something he was good at. Uh, personal opinion on him, I mean, how much he's taught me, not only in the realm on the field, but also off the field. The maturity that he's um, shown as a coach has kind of uh, rubbed off onto me. And I mean, I, I owe him a lot. and. Only thing I can do and thank him, shake his hand, maybe hug him if he lets me. But I mean, he's he's meant a lot to me, and I know he has meant a lot to a lot of other players as well. Uh, he teaches a lot about the game, um, but even more about life. I think he's got a strong personality, and the aspect of his, he's he's very committed to uh, helping young men develop into uh, men and, and productive people in society. And you know, he taught me so much with you know, hard work and, and team, how to be a team player. So, you know, I really enjoyed um, his profession. And I'd say like many families um, who have a parent that's a collegiate coach kind of know that it's not a uh, nine to five job. It's more of like a lifestyle. Um, but that athletic lifestyle kind of seems normal as a kid because that's all you know. Uh, I'd say like looking back now, I realized that I was like coordinating family vacations or on recruiting trips and you know watching Disney or kid movies on a team bus while heading to a weekend away game might not necessarily be normal, but um, you know it's a reality for many coaching families, and I probably wouldn't change a thing about how I was raised. Yeah, I don't know what he, else he would have done. I mean, when I think about all the different careers and he. Um, there was an article just, just in fact, he just gave me a magazine this morning, and there was an article on him in the magazine. And Danny Schmitz, the coach from Bowling Green, made a comment. He said, Joe Carbone is OU baseball, and OU baseball is Joe Carbone. Joe is a, a not only a wonderful uh, human being, but he is an outstanding baseball coach. And, you know, over uh, our 30 plus years of uh, going against one another, you know, one thing I always uh, would tell my team before we'd face the Ohio U Bobcats is that you better bring your A game because if you don't bring your A game, okay, Coach Carbone and his team would uh, would hand it to you in a heartbeat. Joe was, uh, oh, you know, um, probably a, the leader. Uh, I think we all looked at Joe uh, as somebody that uh, um, understood the game maybe a little bit more than all of us. and. Uh, uh, knew how to sacrifice individual performance for the sake of the team, and uh, uh, we had a great relationship. He has that uh, wonderful smile and charisma about him that uh, was contagious on the rest of the team. But it was more than baseball that shaped Carbone into what he is today. It was 1970. Joe Carbone was captain of yet another Bob Run Mac championship team, and this team was about to embark on another adventure. Yet as the Vietnam War raged on, College campuses across the country felt the wave of rebellion from protesters. A day that rings true to many is May 4, 1970, when the Ohio National Guard shot unarmed students at Kent State. But a date that is a little less familiar to some is May 15, when the roar of outcries became too much for Athens. Although, that date is one that those associated with Ohio University baseball will never forget. It was, it was quite a time. That was a chaotic year. It was a very traumatic time. Well, the College World Series uh, championship uh, year was a real strange year. Oh, it was a, I mean, we tell this story over and over again. And just the fact that they were 
away playing, and when they came back to campus, campus was closed. We left campus on Thursday evening to go play Bowling Green. We finished up at Bowling Green, and uh, as we were finishing the game at the Bowling Green, there was mass riot broke out, and there were thousands of people streaming across the campus, and uh, we were a little feared. We, we had bats in our hands and as we boarded the bus. And when they came back to campus, campus was closed. And so when we were coming back Sunday evening to uh, Athens, Ohio, we were met by the, by the colonel on Columbus Road. They stopped our bus. Athens was burning. They burned down Athens virtually. And they stopped our bus uh, about three or four miles outside of campus, pulled us off the bus. Now this is like at 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night. Searched us, made us pull our baggage off of the thing. I mean, it was the stupidest thing. And then they gave us, uh, they told us to go in into town. They took us into town. They dropped us off. We uh, went to our dorms. We weren't allowed to leave our dorms. And we had to be out of there by, I think it was 8.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. So we came down here and the bus pulled down on the campus and it was just like, it was very surreal. It was, there was nobody here, just National Guard surrounding the campus. We had to be off campus, so school closed down. And we had won the MAC. And so for the next uh, two or three weeks, we lived up at Ted Klazuski's baseball camp. And uh, that facility was nice enough to allow Dad to take his team over there, and they stayed in the, uh, I think back then they had cabins, and it was kind of a rustic, uh, <laughs> kind of a getaway. But they were able to prepare because they'd been told that they weren't able to stay on campus. So, you know, I think it was, uh, it was a bit unsettling. Uh, you know, I think that time period was, you know, kind of instrumental in my dad, you know, making the decision to get out of coaching because, uh, you know, it was a difficult time. Changing everything up um, at, I mean, at a point in time when you were expecting to be able to practice at OU and, and, and head out to play in the district and, and all that stuff was going on. It was, it was a little, uh, it was a little bit distracting, but uh, it all worked out. Ted Lazuski baseball camp ended up being a great place for a stay. Of course, want anything to do it to like Ted Klazuski baseball you're, you're camp. But nowhere. With us and at the time we didn't know if we'd have a be able to finish the season it was going to be a decision by the president and, and um, I remember Mr. Roar, our athletic director came and talked to the team and said he was going to do everything he could to try to convince the president to allow us to finish the season and fortunately he did because we end up beating Toledo the last weekend and then going to the regionals and then getting into the College World Series. So if he hadn't have done that, all of those great things that happened to our baseball team and this university wouldn't have happened. Thanks to the administration, Ohio's season continued on and took the team where it had always hoped to reach. As a player, um, our goal was to go to Omaha. I mean, our goal from fall practice was to play in Omaha. We had been to the regionals two years before and felt we were as good as anybody there. And some teams went to Omaha that we felt we were as good as. So we dedicated our senior year to play and work as hard as we could to get to Omaha. And we had a little rally cry, uh, call your ma from Omaha, you know what I mean? That was our little, little rally cry. And, uh, and, and, and we attained that goal. Nobody got hurt, we played real well, and we really didn't have a bump in the road. Yeah, 1970, uh, probably the uh, second most exciting year of my life if we're talking strictly uh, professional accomplishments. Uh, you know, we ended up finishing fourth in the country. We we didn't win the College World Series, but uh, we surely represented the Mid-American Conference well. Uh, Behind the team through it all was Ohio's former head coach, Bob Wren. Coach, <laughs> coach was, uh, we called Coach the master psychologist. He he could tell you what you, he could tell you, he, he could break you down at one point, but then build you right back up in the next minute. You know, if he if he felt that you weren't doing something right, he really would let you know. He 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 was a guy that off the field everybody loved him and everything, but on the field he he was a taskmaster. You know, Ohio University, uh, you know, was everything. Uh, you know, he grew up in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, kind of a humble, very humble background. 
and Ohio University was uh, really his family. Without Coach Wren and his influence in my life uh, as a ball player and a young man, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here where I'm sitting right now. He, he, he uh, explained the meaning of loyalty and what loyalty is to teammates and coaching staff. And he got us to understand about what it's like to play for a team and uh, uh, have the unity. Carbone and Wren's relationship reached far beyond the baseball diamond. I think my dad saw a lot of himself in Joe. He, uh, Joe was an infielder, middle infielder, played second base in college, but I think in high school he may have played some shortstop and you know he was he's slight of build. My dad wasn't real big, he was 5'10 or so and Joe was fast, uh, could run the bases and my dad was, that's kind of the way he played. He was, he was real quick and uh, I think you know, going back to when Joe was a player, uh, my dad, you know, took a shining to him, I think, and, uh, you know, they, over the years, became, uh, you know, very close. And I think Joe kind of looked at him as a father figure, and I think Bob kind of referred to Joe as, as a, his son. I mean, they were very, very close. Um, I mean, Bob is who brought Joe here, and, um, and even after Joe got the job, I mean, Bob was really important part of his life. Um, he would just show up, be sitting on this deck, in fact, waiting for Joe to come home from practice. And they played golf together, so they were very, very close. You know, they were buddies, you know, then they were coaching buddies, and uh, everyone, kids, uh, used to kid me that Joe was our, my dad's second son. And my dad used to kid me by saying that Joe was the only one smart enough to be a bobcat. 24 years, the magic number for both Ren and Carbone. And as Wren's impact on Ohio University is felt every time someone steps into the stadium, Carbone's legacy will continue on in a similar fashion. Uh, he's done a lot for me as a person and as a coach, so that's something that's, that's priceless to me that I'll that'll go, I'll hold with me and cherish for a long time. You know, his career number of wins is, uh, you, know, it's, you know, he passed my dad in, in overall wins a long time ago, and, uh, you know, that certainly will you know, we'll be on the record forever. I know that even though we'll, we'll be starting with a new coach coming up, that will have to start their own legacy and their own, that, that next chapter they're going to write. Um, it's been very helpful to have some consistency in, in the years that Joe's been here. And he's done a great job and just a quality individual. It's, it's definitely going to be some pressure on the next coach that comes in because Coach Carbone's had so much success and had so much influence here. But overall, he's just, I mean, he's, there's no words that can really put in a contest. Coach Carbone's great. His time as a coach at Ohio University may be over, but the title coach will precede the name Carbone for many years to come. Yes, I think that he, that it's part of who he is, and you know, whether it's, I think he is a coach by heart. said I probably would have, I could have buried him at home plate, because <laughs> I'm sure he will be on a ball field for many, many years to come. I mean, he just enjoys working with 18 to 22 year olds, and so when, um, this does come to an end. I think he will be looking to look, work with minor league ball, ball teams and coaching young guys again. With, with where they were with the retirement system, it was best for me to retire here this year. And um, I'm going to continue coaching. Uh, I might go into professional baseball or I might go into college summer league baseball. But I'm just going to continue to coach till probably I die. And, uh, you know, I will people volunteer at hospitals and volunteer and that's great and uh, I'll be volunteering on some little league field someday when I'm however old I am <laughs> it's still it. it's still be out there yeah. <laughs> but I always feel that's that's the best place to go if I'm gonna go